and welcome to this Rational Fans Podcast. That is Rational Fans with a Z. First thing we'd like to do this morning on Veterans Day is, of course, thank our veterans for all the hard work in the past and those currently serving today. We thank you for everything that you do. And now the college football playoff rankings came out last night. It is Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, and Notre Dame. I'd like to point out that each week Notre Dame's resume just keeps growing stronger and stronger. They, their only loss was to the one seed, Clemson. They beat Army. They beat Navy. Navy beat, was the team that beat Memphis. But they beat Navy, who only has one loss to Notre Dame. And they still beat Temple. Their, their resume just keeps growing stronger and stronger each season. And they could potentially jump Ohio State for the three seed there as well. So I'm going to turn to Rhett here. What was something that you liked or saw this week in college football? You know, I think that Clemson is the real deal this season. Um, you know, they've got a solid lineup just, you know, from for, from Deshaun Watson, you know, all the way down to, um, you know, Leggett and Gallman, the the running back and wide receiver. They've got a really talented team, and you know Dabo Sweeney knows how to he knows how to get a team to win, and we've seen him before uh, get teams to win. And you know this week was big for them beating Florida State. You know that was their big test, but they're not quite out of the woods yet. Um, being a number one team, being undefeated, everyone's going to come at you. You've got a big target on your back, so you can't just say, "Oh, well, now we beat Florida State, we can you know kind of take these last few games easy." You know they still got to focus. So it's just going to be interesting to see if Clemson falls prey to an upset or if they manage to hold on and go undefeated. All right, so Evan, what was something that you saw in college football that really caught your eye this weekend? All right, so as you know, Nebraska beat Michigan State, so it kind of clears up the the college football playoff picture a little bit because if Michigan State does end up beating Ohio State, then the Big Ten champion is not going to the uh, college football playoffs. What about fifth-ranked Iowa? Oh, I forgot about Iowa. Well, if Ohio State, if Michigan State did happen to win that game, they still wouldn't get to the college football playoffs, I wouldn't think. And, uh, you know, Nebraska, they're not really a, that great of a team. So this is kind of one of those, I'll call them a useless upset, where it doesn't help the team that ups- upsets the other team because they're still not going anywhere. And then Michigan State is a team that should be going places and then now isn't. So that's kind of a... Kind of a quirky game, a huge misstep for Michigan State, and it pretty much ruined their season as in national title hopes. You know, this is one of the more crazy fo- college football seasons we've ever seen, especially in our lives because we're so young. But we have the Michigan blocked punt for a touchdown, and then you got the Pitt Florida State blocked field goal for a touchdown. Georgia Tech Florida State. I, I, that's what I meant, excuse me. And then you got. The Miami Duke kick return touchdown last week. And then you got the Arkansas Ole Miss first down. That was just crazy. Like, he was going to go down and just threw it backwards. And there just happened to be Ole a Miss, guy. Ole Miss just couldn't catch. They couldn't even pick up the ball. There just happened yeah. to be a guy there to catch that. And then, like you said, the Nebraska-Michigan State game, he was out of bounds. And the refs called that a uh, Michigan State player pushed him out. And he got back in bounds as soon as he could, so that was a touchdown. Which that was a bad call, but it still brought a bunch of chaos to the college football world. There, there's been a ton of crazy game-ending plays this season, and it's I think it's just going to get crazier. You've got a couple teams that have heavy backloaded schedules, so you're going to have a lot of big powerhouse matchups, and they're going to all be interesting to see. Well, you know, this is what the NCAA wants because they want to make college football as exciting as possible. And I think that college football really is the most exciting brand of football that there is because you got all these wacky scores. Like Temple beat SMU 60 to 40. I mean, last week you had Oklahoma State, they had to score 70 points to win. And so it's just really exciting, especially if you really like offense, which I do. And so I think college football is great in that respect. All right, so Nate, I'm going to turn to you now. What is something that caught your eye in college football this weekend? Well, you know, I think um, we obviously need to mention the uh, Alabama LSU game. Um, you know, as a mild LSU fan, you know that that game really reminded me of uh, Minnesota Vikings at 49ers Week One. I mean, they didn't do anything. They just laid an 
egg in uh at Alabama, you know, that was um that was something else. You know, Leonard Fournette, you know, he pulled his best DeMarco Murray impression by gaining less than like negative twenty yards or well that wasn't actually the stat, but that's what it felt like. Um and you know, the Alabama, you know, they just they well for some reason Nick Saban has just always had less miles number. You know, Alabama's beat L S U five times in a row now. And um it as it currently stands now, you know, Alabama's gonna continue that uh reign of dominance against L S U. With no. that Ole Miss loss, Alabama is now on top of the SEC West and they now control their own destiny to the college football playoffs, really. Our only hope for keeping Alabama out of the playoff is if Florida beats them in the SEC championship you game. You still never know. You still exactly. never know. Honestly, Auburn no. could beat them. It, that's true. Yeah, that's maybe. true. Jeremy Johnson looked pretty good. Saturday. Always got to keep your hopes right. up. But with that game, Leonard Fournette only ran for 31 yards. And, you know, that's obviously not going to help his Heisman case. But how much does it really hurt it? Because. Alabama is a great football team. They have been for a couple, the last couple years, really almost a decade, and they've they've just been able to shut down running backs on a consistent basis. So, you know, with the voters, this game isn't going to look good for Fournette. But I don't think his Heisman hopes are completely gone yet. I think that they're in serious jeopardy because, I mean, as you guys know, it's not all about crazy stats, and he still has ridiculous numbers, but it's also you know they don't pick uh, they don't pick players from uh, teams that lose big like this in key situations, and he kind of choked. It felt like because it was supposed to be you know Leonard Fournette and Derrick Henry going head to head. Derrick Henry had a monster game. Leonard Fournette he just it fell off the face of the planet there. Well, so, it's not like Alabama just shut down Fournette. They also shut down Brandon Harris, six of nineteen for 128 yards and a pick, along with a touchdown. But that's just six of nineteen. That is terrible. Yeah, uh, that's that's Christian Ponder like. <laughs> but um, you know, another thing I observed too. You know, uh, LSU's good offensive line was just getting mm. manhandled by Alabama. You know, they were not getting any push um, against the uh, really good uh, Alabama defensive line. Um, and you know, that's. Uh, quite honestly, you know, something that LSU hasn't been used to all season. You know, they haven't had, they haven't gone against a team that's shut down Leonard Fournette. And when they, when Alabama did shut him down, you know, that went or there goes their whole offense. So, um, yeah, they just they killed them. You know, while we're kind of on the Heisman talk, you know, Derrick Henry, he definitely helped his case. And so you've got another guy from Alabama kind of coming up to the front of that pack. And everybody's saying, well, now he's the favorite to win the Heisman because Trevon Boykin looked extremely bad against Oklahoma State. He just looked lost. I think he threw three picks, maybe two. Either way, that's a lot. But no one's thinking about Zeke Elliott. He's had a streak of 10, I think 10, 10 or 11 games with over 100 yards dating back to the Big Ten Championship last year against Wisconsin. And he, you know, he's consistently been good for Ohio State. But Ohio State's just been mediocrely winning games, and I think he's getting a little bit overlooked because of that. When in reality, he's one of he is the main reason that Ohio State is still undefeated. You know, it's been crazy to see the kind of the resurgence of the running back this year because I mean, you have of course Leonard Fournette, Derrick Henry, Zeke Elliott, even Nick Chubb before he was hurt, and so really it seemed like it's been the running backs that have been carrying these great offenses. I mean, it's still a passing game. But honestly, like when you see a team like LSU, a top team, their running back gets shut down and they can't do anything because they rely so heavily on the run. And so it's just kind of been a resurgence of the run game and it's kind of cool to see. Well, it's definitely not going to be a quarterback that wins no. the Heisman this year. And that's honestly is a welcome thing for me because, you know, quarterbacks, they touch the ball every play. So they have the ability to make or break a game every time that they are on the field. And running backs, you know, they've got... They've got the ability when they touch when they get the ball on you know every every so often they've got the ability to break off a big play and you know they they have to work harder to get noticed because they aren't involved in every play you'll see some pass plays and some run plays but those running backs they, to do the little things to help their team win those don't always get noticed whereas the quarterback is involved 
all the time, and they are the ones that are in the spotlight. You know, one really, you know, who you know who a beast is, Corey Coleman from Baylor. I mean, he had a monster game this past week, and he like even with a backup quarterback in, he still put up over two hundred yards and two TDs. Like, did you see that like that touchdown that he caught when he got mm. like, WWE slammed to the ground? I mean, that, I was, that was impressive. the game winner. Yeah, uh, it was. He had a monster game. He's probably for me top three in the Heisman right now, along with Derrick Henry and Zeke Elliott. You know, I would have put um, oh Josh Doxson up there too. He's, but you know, he got hurt against Oklahoma State, so he was out for most of that game. But you know, he's he's such a dynamic player, and he's just so big and so fast and so strong that he, you know, you can't help but throw to him. And he's one of those guys that you've always got to account for and. You know, he's almost like he's almost like a Calvin Johnson. No matter how many guys you put on him, he's going to find a way to catch the ball. And that's really hurtful for TCU with him going down. And hopefully he's okay. But, you know, that's the thing for him is that I think his Heisman chances are gone now that Trevon Boykin looked bad and he's hurt. So I think that it's going to be a running back or quite possibly with the outside chance of Coleman getting in there. You know... I don't think anybody said a word about this guy, but Christian McCaffrey mm. from Stanford mm-hmm. is quietly working his way into the top three of the Heisman race. I was wa- I forget which college football show I was watching, but with Reggie Bush's 2005 Heisman season, Christian McCaffrey matches his rushing yards per game and passing yards per game Basically to the yard, there's like a point seven yard difference both ways, but he's doing really really good this season, and nobody talks about him. Yeah, he's been quietly consistent and quietly good. Um, he does get overlooked a little bit uh, just because there's some bigger big bigger name players out there. You know, like your like Fournette and Elliott and um, Henry, but. You know, there's another guy kind of flying under the radar right now is Dalvin Cook for Florida State. You know, we saw him torch a Clemson defense that had not allowed more than, I believe, 70-some rushing yards a game to any team. And Dalvin Cook comes out and torches them for 194 yards on 21 carries. He, well, I mean, obviously that's big when you have a 75-yard run, but um, he just tore up the Clemson uh, defense and like Evan said, it's the resurgence of the running back, and that goes all the way from you know you've got five five or six big name running backs right now in college football, and they're all you know big and possessing the ability to break off a big play at any given moment. Christian McCaffrey's stats: he has 134.1 rush yards per game, 1,207 on the season for six touchdowns, and his receiving stats: he's got 40 yards per game. To go with two touchdowns, I I don't understand why nobody's talking about him. He's putting up almost he's putting up numbers just like anybody else in the Heisman race. It's just the big name product you don't see, like you got the Leonard Fournette and Derrick Henry. Like they come from big schools, so you're gonna see mm-hmm. them more on prime time, and you'll get to see more of them playing. So you won't see Christian McCaffrey. Well, you know, the thing about Christian McCaffrey is that he's playing on a He's playing on a team that's quietly good, so he's going to be quietly good because his team is quietly good. Stanford are they've just kind of, they've kind of climbed up in the rankings as the season has gone on, and they jumped to eleventh after they smoked uh, Colorado. And you know Stanford they're playing some good football right now, and you know they're they're definitely still in consideration for the playoff. They've got that one bad loss to Northwestern though. Um, you know, that's going to hurt them in the long run, but they're playing some good football and McCaffrey's on fire. So I wouldn't be surprised to see McCaffrey start rising, especially when it comes to crunch time and also Stanford to keep rising up in the rankings. Stanford, they're actually number, uh, number seven. Mm, they jumped. Actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're, uh, they're, they're looking really good actually. I mean, they got them right behind, uh, right behind Baylor. And mm. so <laughs> that's what I want to talk about is Baylor. What will it take for a Big 12 team to make it into the college football playoffs? Like, oh how- man, I, I honestly right now I think that Oklahoma State has the best shot of any Big 12 team. They're still undefeated, 
So is Baylor, but Baylor is playing with that backup quarterback, Stidham. He didn't look terrible. He threw for more yards than Seth Russell had thrown in a game, 425. Right, but the offense, you know, they didn't put up as many points, and they they just kind of looked, eh, is, I guess is the best way to say it. And if I think if Oklahoma State wins out, they've already got a huge win over TCU, and they still have to play Baylor and Oklahoma those two, those two teams are are ranked pretty high still, and I think honestly Oklahoma State has the best chance if they win out and outright win the Big Twelve title and convincingly beat Baylor and Oklahoma. I think they have the best shot of anybody. You know, it's times like this that make us glad that we are Big Ten fans for the most part, and that we don't have to suffer through this kind of. Anti Big Twelve ism the that most, we've seen. The most ironic thing about the Big Twelve is that their conference motto is one true champion. And last year they had co champions that kept each other out of the playoff. I just uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> so are we gonna turn to our game of the week this week? Is anybody got anything else? Dad? Alright, so Rhett, I'm gonna turn to you first. What is a big game for you this upcoming week? Um, you know, it's getting crunch time for teams, so there's just starting to be a lot more games this week that are more important. Um, you know, Florida State, they've got to go through a 6-3 and three NC State team that's kind of been, eh. So, you know, uh, Florida State, they, with that loss to Clemson, lost their chance to play in the ACC championship. So, you know, they're really just kind of trying to survive and um, not look terrible but you know the North Carolina sitting at 8-1 ranked 23rd playing Miami who shocked a couple teams this season um North Carolina they're playing for a spot in the ACC title game and that's another thing Clemson like I said Clemson's not out of the woods so they they could have to meet you know a good North Carolina team in the ACC championship and that's going to be tough for them Nate, what is a big game for you this week? Um, my game of the week would actually have to be uh, Stanford versus Oregon. Um, st- uh, you know, this is a good opportunity for uh, Christian McCaffrey, you know, like we've said before, um, to uh, build on his uh, Heisman campaign, you know, if he still has a shot, which he might. Um, and, you know, he, he has a good chance to uh, torch Oregon's defense, but... Um, you know, uh, Oregon. You know, they're down this year, but they still have uh, they still have that opportunity to put up big points. So this will, I think, this will be a good test for Stanford. And on to Evan. What is a big game for you this week? You know, we got a pretty big matchup in the American Conference. We got Memphis versus Houston, and uh, uh, Memphis coming in off a disappointing loss. They're uh, number twenty-one. Houston is still undefeated. They are nine and zero. So this could be uh, a big for who's tops in the American Conference. Whoever wins the American Conference, I don't. They're not going to make it to the College Football Playoff, but they could have a shot at a pretty significant bowl game. You know, uh, Houston's got their first year coach, Tom Herman. He was the Ohio State offensive coordinator last season. You know, on that national championship team, and we saw what he could do. And he's definitely taken that to Houston, and he's got them to nine and zero, and that's. That's you know that's great to see a small a smaller school as far as Division One goes, you know going nine and zero playing extremely good football. I'm I'm surprised nobody spoke of this game, but you have Baylor Oklahoma, and the Big Twelve. Oklahoma still has that one loss. They're they're still sitting on the bubble. A couple of things need to happen for them to make the playoffs. Baylor's undefeated. They're mm-hmm. sixth. So this is a big game for both teams. If either of them want to make the college football playoffs, that loss was to Texas, so it looks pretty bad. Another <laughs> another useless upset there. Seventy seven on the over under for that game, by the way. Wow. Uh, it's going to be a high scoring game. Oklahoma scores a lot. Baylor scores a lot. I I definitely take the over there. Mm-hmm. So we're going to turn to the NFL now. I know there's really about just three games we want to talk about. <laughs> I mean, we could say a couple words about the other games, but but nothing as important as those three games. And if you ever listened to us, you would know those what those three games are. <laughs> so which one are we going to start with first? Well, you know, Mason, I'm going to take it from you. I'm going to take the uh, 
Panthers Packers game um, this past weekend. Um, I'm I'm gonna call the Panthers legit now. Um, you know they they uh they, for the most part they smothered the Packers. Um, you know, they, late in that they, game, yeah, 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 they did. But you know, hey, that's why you build the uh, big thirty-seven point lead, so you don't necessarily have to worry too much about it. But um, yeah, the uh, Panthers' uh, defense came up clutch in the end, and uh, they uh, the Packers weren't able to force overtime. And uh, you know, for the most part, you know, the Packers they they looked like they struggled again, and. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know the uh, we'll we'll have to see what they do going forward. But yeah, the Panthers look great. The Panthers really got their passing game open in that mm-hmm. game. You you saw a lot of deep bombs. Cam Newton throwing deep bombs to Devin Funches, and then Corey Brown and Ted Ginn Jr. All three mm-hmm. of those had a fifty yard catch, I think. And then Greg Olson was Greg Olson again. He's definitely having a Pro Bowl season there at, at the tight end position. You know, kind of in in conjunction with that game, the Vikings Rams game, Vikings pulled it out in overtime. Um, you know, with that field goal from Blair Walsh, and that puts them in a tie for first in the NFC North. And I don't know when the last time that happened was, but it's kind of it's. I've said this so many times on this podcast. The Vikings have arrived. And at this point, I wouldn't I wouldn't be a sure I wouldn't place a sure bet on the Packers to win the NFC North. The Vikings are a horrible Monday night football loss to the 49ers away from taking a seven and one lead and controlling the division. And if Teddy Bridgewater didn't fumble on that last drive against the Broncos, they're eight no. Well, yeah, you know, with that Broncos game, you know, I I think there were plenty of other mistakes that were made, but um, you know, their offensive line didn't hold up very well, but um, yeah, you know, the Vikings, they uh they have some pretty good tests coming up here. You know, we're we're going to see just how legit this team is. Um this uh this weekend they're at the Raiders, I believe. You know, it's yeah, the Raiders are up and down this year, but um, you know, Derek Carr has been on fire. Uh and um it's it's always tough to go out and uh, play in the Bay, so that'll I think that'll be a good test for them. And then, of course, they're home against the Packers. That'll be a great matchup. Mm-hmm. Um, then they, I believe they play maybe at the Falcons, and they also play home against Seattle. So, you know, that we, we got some pretty good games coming up. You know, you got to be just a little bit worried about the implications of that just disgusting mm. really hit that Teddy mm-hmm. Bridgewater. I mean, that made my heart sink, seeing him get clobbered like that so late. And it, it just felt dirty, and I... Yeah, you can say something, Nate. <laughs> yeah, you know, let, let me rant about that a little. So, we got uh, the Rams defensive coordinator, Greg Williams, <laughs> oh, yeah. was the... <laughs> Heard this uh, one before. He was basically the, um, I guess you could say, president of Bounty Gate a few years ago. Bounty Club which, of New Orleans. Yeah, which um, screwed the Vikings over in the NFC Championship game because Brett Favre got beat up and he had no clue what he was doing, so he just started chucking You have a legitimate gripe as a Vikings yes, fan, I'm, don't you? Yes, all Vikings fans, yes. They, they hold on to grudges way too long, but we have good reason. So anyway, <laughs> Roger Goodell, he... When they find out that Bounty Gate happened, you know, they kick Greg Williams out of the league, you know, Goodell's like, oh, you're gone forever. But then Jeff Fisher, Rams head coach, comes along and says, oh, no, he's fine because, you know, I'm a good head coach and I know what I'm talking about. And, no, oh, he's, he's a good coach. Bring him back in. And Goodell's like, okay, I don't care because I'm sitting here making millions. And, um, yeah, let's just bring him back into the league. So Greg Williams comes back into the league uh, as the Rams defensive coordinator. And, you know, ever since then, you know, he's just had a dirty reputation, you know, just training, you know, he's, um, they've recorded him saying before, you know, oh, you know, go tear this guy's ACL or, you know, give this guy a concussion, you know, then we'll have a better chance to win. Like, are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. You, that's, you know, there's a fine line between, you know, playing hard defense Mm -hmm. and playing dirty defense and greg williams has obviously stepped over that line once you've got a criminal record you've got a criminal record and he has a criminal record what bothers me about greg williams is that his there's three g's in his name 
Why is it G R E G G? Why is the extra G necessary? <laughs> That's not even as important as this bounty program. It's just <laughs> a weird name. <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about. You mentioned Derek Carr was on fire. That uh, that Steelers Raiders game. That was a oh, barn yeah. burner. Watching that, seeing them come back. It was a uh, thirty-five to twenty-one. How did the Steelers win with Landry Jones? I don't know. Well, because Antonio Brown had 300,000 receiving yards. (laughs) I mean, that was was an entertaining game to watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, the Raiders lost, but, you know, they put up big numbers on offense. Their defense, it's still a little bit questionable. They gave up some big plays to Landry Jones late in the game, which kind of cost him the game. Derek Carr threw some untimely interceptions there at the end. But even still, this is still a really good Raiders team that I think any team should be afraid of playing. Landry, excuse me, Derek Carr only threw one interception. He threw a untimely interception. So just take off that S off of that interception. (laughs) My bad. You know, a big game that... I'm surprised Evan didn't mention was Broncos Colts. I was getting to okay. it. Okay. All right. The Colts I did, you know up until yesterday I didn't think we we're going to have the Colts suck segment, but I think we have to now that Andrew Luck's out. So go ahead, Evan. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> All right. So the day after the biggest win of the year for the Colts, an impressive win against a team that's not in the AFC South, Andrew Luck has his best game of the season by far. Mm-hmm. No turnovers. Frank Gore had a good game. Uh, Chud, you know, he said he was going to rely on Frank Gore, and he, he kind of did, especially in the first half. Frank Gore had some really good runs, and then their defense had a great first half. Yeah, their they offensive had... line actually didn't look like a bunch of ragtag dudes. No, no. They looked decent. They, well, I mean, their interior line especially has really improved, and uh, you know, they had that punt return at the end of the first mm. half. But even still, they came back. Andrew Luck threw that touchdown pass to Ahmad Bradshaw, and Adam Vinatieri never misses. He's like the ageless he's wonder. The ageless wonder, even though he's like forty-five, forty-three. Yeah. <laughs> and then so we get we have this huge win. We're going into the bye week. We're, We're feeling, feeling good. good. Yeah. yeah. Chuck Pagano's not going to get fired in the bye week this time. And we're all thinking, you know what? Maybe the Colts season is saved. And then we get the worst news possible. Ah! You know, Andrew Luck with the lacerated spl- uh, kidney. Spleen, kidney, torn abdominal, out two to six weeks. No, no. Hopefully no. it's only two. <laughs> Why? Ah! Why, Andrew? You know, the play after he got hurt, he threw the touchdown pass to Ahmad Bradshaw. Put him in a wheelchair and send him on the field. I don't care. <laughs> you know, Matt Hasselbeck. He had two pretty good games, nothing spectacular. Most, he didn't throw an interception, yeah. but that was against the Houston Texans and the Jacksonville Jaguars. Well, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and talk about the Colts' upcoming schedule. After the bye week, they play the Falcons who are kind of going off the deep end. Yeah, they're crap. Uh <laughs> follow that with the Buccaneers, Steelers, Jaguars, Texans, Dolphins, Titans. So if Hasselback has to play just even the next three games, he should be able to get him two wins, at least over the Buccaneers and the Steelers. You know, this kind of compares to the Cam Newton, Derek Anderson situation last year. Derek Anderson filled in for Cam Newton after Cam Newton's car crash, and he picked up two big wins that they absolutely needed to get to the playoffs. Yeah, they limped into the playoffs in a bad division, which is what the Colts are hoping to do <laughs> so now. It's basically the same thing for both teams. You have a bad, an average team at best, limping into the playoffs with a backup quarterback who's like forty years old. <laughs> after their star quarterback got hurt and went down, and their backup quarterback has to fill in for those three or four games and make big plays. Yeah, you know the crazy thing about winning, like last year, the, how the the uh, Panthers won the N- NFC South and how the Colts could win the AFC South. Is there just a matter of one game away from being like, you know, a top 10 pick in the draft as opposed to being like not, you know, between the 10 and 20 range just because they made the playoffs? So, you know, the the Falcons had the like 13th pick or something last year where the Panthers made the playoffs and they were stuck with what, 18th ish somewhere in there? Well, they won in the wild card, so they were in the 
mid twenties. Yeah. Right. That's but the thing about that is they had an identical regular season record, but one team won the division, one team didn't, and the one team was higher up in the draft. And that's just the crazy thing about football is that the the Colts who could possibly go seven and nine if their last three wins are against the AFC South, which are all but guaranteed, uh, they could be a seven and nine team going into the playoffs, which is the crazy thing about the NFL. And they'd be a four seed ahead of who knows, maybe like like a I don't know a nine and seven or a ten and six uh, Raiders team. You know that's what I worry about because how much of a prize is it to go and get destroyed in the wild card by a team that's probably better than you? Only to cheat yourself out of a higher draft pick, and is that much of a prize? I, I wouldn't. Say well, the Colts so. would ruin the draft pick anyway. Yeah, you're so. right. You're right. They would probably pick some, I don't know, some four, some wide receiver that runs a three seven forty or somehow, and then they go and they muff a punt in the first game, and then they sit the bench then, the rest of the season. Yeah, get hurt. Well, I will say this about the Colts. Um, you know, may, I think, uh, you know, last week, you know, uh, we were, well, you know, we were kind of confused with the firing of Pep Hamilton. You know, we're like, ah, oh, Colts, what are you doing? You know, he, sh- he should have been your next head coach. But um, uh, with uh, Rob Chudzinski, he's dialing up some plays that uh, actually benefits the offensive line. You know, he... Um, He's uh, Andrew Luck. Well, he was, and hopefully will return this uh, season. But um, he was uh, throwing um, just some quicker passes, and uh, the offensive line didn't have to block for a very long, or had to block for a very long time, and uh, that really benefited the offense. And they were also able to run the ball. And um, you know, I think with Pep Hamilton, you know, he was calling some plays that maybe took a little too long to develop down the field within, uh, like. Uh, running with wide receivers running routes and things like that, and so uh, yeah, we'll we'll see uh, what uh, Chud has going on in Indy in the next few weeks. I was talking with Evan on this one, and Rob Chudzinski's name is tainted by the whole Brown situation. He was a good offensive coordinator in Carolina, and then you you can't bring an offensive-minded coach into Cleveland and expect results. You can't bring a coach into Cleveland or players or a front office in Cleveland and expect results. But an offensive-minded coach in Cleveland, what does he have to work with? I was just going to say that that's his tainted record isn't his fault that it's tainted. Well, you know, I think, um, yeah, the Browns' record has, you know, kind of always stunk over the past, you know, forever. But, um you know, what What was it in 2013 when the Browns had uh, Josh Gordon and uh, when he wasn't uh, smoking pot and um, and uh, Jordan Cameron, you know, Rob Chudzinski and uh, Norv Turner, you know, they were able to actually create a decent offense in Cleveland. You know, Gordon put up numbers and uh, so did Jordan Cameron, their tight end. And uh, Brian Hoyer looked kind of decent that year. But, you know, of course, Cleveland Browns, you know, just clean the off front office and head coaching, you know, every two seasons. So, yeah. You know, that's the thing about the top contenders that the bottom feeders don't have. You always have your bottom feeders, like the Browns, the Texans, the Titans. They don't have coaching stability. Like, on the top teams, the Panthers, Seahawks, Patriots. I mean, Ron Rivera had a couple bad seasons. They stuck with him. Now they're 8-0. And that's coaching stability right there. Pete Carroll, coaching stability. Bill Belichick, coaching stability. But with the Browns, they're getting a new coach every season. Oh, yeah, I totally agree with that. And, um, you know, that a lot of it, you know, it just starts with ownership. Um, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times, you know, the owners, they'll hire this GM that they like. And the GM will go and... Uh, you know, hire a president, you know, front office people, and then uh, they'll go hire a head coach too. But then, you know, midway through the season or something, you know, they'll fire the head coach, but they'll keep the GM, or they'll fire the GM and keep the head coach. And, uh, you know, that mix-up of power, you know, in the off season, it, you know, everyone has a different idea of what's going on, and they never accomplish anything. But that's why, you know, a team like the Patriots, they're good every year, Because everyone has the same plan going forward, and they all want to be successful uh, at the exact same rate and time. You know, if you're like if you're Ken Wisenhut bad, then I can see why you're fired. But if if you're Rob Jadzinski in your first season with the Browns, 
I think you should have stayed another season and maybe worked your way up in the because you were kept getting those draft picks and you could have been good after a couple seasons. You know, here's my last comment on the Colts for now. There's just their entire front office is a mess. There's a rift between Jim Irsay and Ryan Grigson. Pagano and Grigson hate each other. You know, Pep Hamilton gets fired. It just seems like a mess. And, you know, we do have that one positive win. Everybody can feel good about it for the next two weeks. But then, you know, I think eventually reality is going to set in that something is amiss, something isn't right, and then something needs to be done, and heads are still going to roll whether they make the playoffs or not. You know, the I, I never have been a big fan of Ursay. Just, I, I honestly, I think he's a classless guy. But, you know, honestly, when he, when he, you know, he divorced Peyton Manning from the team, that was the right move because Manning was old and you're not sure what you would have got from him. And you had the number one pick with Andrew Luck coming out of college and he was so enticing and you wanted him. And so you couldn't keep Manning around because you'd have to sit one of them. So he had to get rid of him. But the way he went about it just, you know, made me hate Ursay that much more. And then he goes and fires Bill Polian, who's now in the Hall of Fame. So you fire a Hall of Fame GM, bring in Grigson, and now the team is a mess. It really just starts with ownership and just spreads its way down. I, I think I agree. Like Nate said, it does start with the ownership. And the owner needs to, if he has a good team that's sprouting and coming up, keep the same core that you have there. Don't fire the GM after a bad 4-12 four, four and 12 season when they went like 0-16 the previous season. They're going to keep coming up. Keep that same core of coaches and staff to help build this young team well the nfl goes in cycles you've got teams that are well at least for the most part it goes in cycles you've got teams that are kind of mediocre to bad at one year and then a couple years later they're towards the top of the nfl and that just comes through development and draft picks and then you've got teams like the patriots who never are bad which yeah let's not talk about that all because of tom Brady. it is right sure once he leaves, right <laughs> but then you've got your teams you know kind of like like the Raiders, they've been so bad for so long, but now they've got some younger guys that are that have that are starting to develop. You know, Derek Carr, Amari Cooper, Khalil Mack on the defense. Those teams are starting to become better, and that's just the way the NFL goes. It just goes in cycles. Yeah, um, yeah, it's cool to see that, and um, you know, I think a a, a good example of uh, kind of sustained success, well, except for this year, has been the uh, Baltimore Ravens. You know, they're having an awful season, but, you know, you don't hear them, um, you know, rumors, you know, oh, Ozzie Newsome, their GM's going to get fired, or, you know, John Harbaugh, you know, he's on the hot seat. You know, no, that's not going to happen because the Ravens know how to be a good franchise, how to uh, spend money in free agency correctly and uh, make solid draft picks. You know, I just think that teams don't know how to win. So they always freak out when they lose because they want to win, but they just don't know how to win. Like, and then there's teams that don't know what to do when they win, like the Browns. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're uncomfortable. Like and last they, season through eight or nine games, they were actually in a wild card they like, spot. They were 6-3 and three at one point. Yeah, and then they just... It all started when they got beat by the Colts, really, in that last season. They just kind of awesome. <laughs> fell. <laughs> all right. I want to get back to last week's results. You know, I took the bait on the Falcons. You know, I was all in. I thought, oh, they're a great team. When they just obliterated the, the Texans, I thought, oh, man, this is going to be a really good team. They just lost to Blaine Gabbert. <laughs> the same Blaine Gabbert that was, you know, gifting the Colts picks a few years ago and as the Titans would lose by 30 something points every game or the Jaguars rather and now he's above Colin Kaepernick and he somehow beats the Falcons who despite the fact that they have Matt Ryan and Julio Jones and Devontae Freeman they can't beat one of the most mediocre franchises in the NFL yeah uh the Falcons like I said earlier they play the Colts in a couple of weeks and they're kind of going down on the deep end Everybody was so high on the Falcons this season, and everybody said, oh, Falcons are so good. I, I will admit, they are still a good team, and, you know, I, I, don't, I honestly don't know what's going on there, but they have pieces in place 
to destroy teams as we've seen them do so far. I think they've just kind of hit a rough patch and they can't seem to get out of it. Yeah, you know, as I've alluded to in the past, um, you know, a team that may start off hot in the beginning of the season won't necessarily be a contender, you know, later in the season or in the playoffs. Um, you know, again, that's just kind of with the cycle of football. You know, it's kind of how it works. But, um, yeah, you know, with the Falcons, their offensive line, you know, they've kind of lost that aggressiveness. And, um, you know, they've, uh, you know, they've kind of lost that swagger that they had at the beginning of the season. And their defense, you know, they're they're starting to kind of give up, too. I mean, yeah, they were bad at the beginning of the season, but at least – or their defense was. But at least they – um. They were trying, you know, but now it's just, eh, you know, go out there, give up, give me my $2 million check every week. You know, I really thought the NFC South was on the rise. You had the Falcons at 6-2, and two, and the Saints were starting to win more games. And even the Buccaneers pulled out a couple wins that you thought they shouldn't have won. But then they come this past week and just absolutely lay a stinker. I mean, you got the Falcons losing to the to the 49ers, the Saints losing to the Titans in overtime. Like, how does that even happen? And then you had the Buccaneers lose to the Giants. All three of those were bad losses, really. Yeah, you know, um, I think, you know, with the NFC South, you know, it might take another year or two for, you know, everyone to be competitive. And this year it basically is uh, Carolina's um, – division for the taking but um yeah you know as for the saints you know what in the world happened uh you know the titans are garbage um and you know they just fired their head coach and you know you'd think that that would um you know just put like a lull in the whole uh organization but you know the titans they ended up coming back and you know they beat the saints so um wow <laughs> I mean, they did get Marcus Mariota back, but how much can that help a team that's probably the worst team in the last two seasons that has won now a total of four games? And your coach is named Mike Malarkey. Like, Malarkey. That's... Yeah, well, I mean, it is kind of discomforting. You know, Mar Marcus Mariota, he's had some really good games this season, and that's the second time he's thrown for four TDs in a game. I know the Colts did beat... Uh, they did beat the Titans earlier in the season when they did have Marcus Mariota playing. But that was with Andrew Luck, who had an amazing fourth quarter. And so if they have to play him with Matt Hasselbeck, I don't know if the Colts would have enough firepower to contend with Marcus Mariota. I'm still I'm I'm still hopeful in Hasselbeck. He's definitely not as uh electrifying, I guess, as Andrew Luck and he doesn't quite have the arm strength. But he's consistent enough and he's a good he's a good leader and he's not gonna let his, you know, he's not gonna let his guys, um, I, I guess, get down on themselves if something's going bad. And I honestly think Hasselback is gonna be, he's gonna be a good enough fill-in for the Colts. You know, the Titans play the Panthers next week, and interim coaches are always deadly. Like when you fire a head coach, the next couple weeks your coach does magically good for some odd reason. Look at the Dolphins. And a couple other teams that fired their head coach and now they're good. Well, good for like a couple games after that. You know, as a Panthers fan, I wasn't really worried about the Titans when they were sitting at 1-6 and six or 1-7. and seven. And then they come in and beat the Saints. And now I, I'm not worried any – I'm not worried really per se. But I'm just kind of I, – well, I guess I am worried now that <laughs> – <laughs> but I'm, I'm worried because I think the Panthers could be looking ahead to the next couple games rather than taking it one game at a time like you always do. I'm sure the Panthers are all happy about this ain't no start. And maybe they're even looking to an undefeated season. But you got to take it one game at a time. I mean, can't. the Titans are an NFL team. So they still have NFL quality players. But you, you just got to take it one game at a time, really. You know, I remember a, a few years ago, the Chiefs started 8-0, mm -hmm. and we all thought, you know, their defense is great, they're going to be such a great team, finish like 11-5, and five, and then they go and they get up on Indy, then they mm. collapse in the wild card. And so, hopefully that's not what we see out of the Panthers. It's possible, but I think that they're a better team yeah, than the that's Chiefs were. <laughs> the biggest downfall of a lot of good football teams is overlooking 
an opponent that's not that doesn't look good on first glance. Like you know, with the Titans, you can't. It's like you said, it's the NFL. You can't overlook anybody. There are teams that aren't as good, but you can't just say, "Oh, well, we've got a guaranteed win here. We don't need to focus on them." You you can't look to sixteen and zero until you're fifteen and zero, and then it just goes down. You can't look to fifteen and zero until you're fourteen and zero, and all the way down until you can't look to ten and zero until you're nine and zero. So the most important thing is just winning this week. You know, the the Panthers really handled that question well in their post game press conferences. They were asked about being 16-0, and and they said we're just looking ahead to the next game. I really hope that they can apply that mentality to what's coming next in the Titans. And I think they've got the Falcons maybe after that. But they just got to take it one game at a time, and that just really worries me that they won't. Like Cam Newton said, 8-0 is 8-0. You know, it doesn't matter how you get there, but what matters is if you can stay undefeated, if you, you, know, if you don't overlook these teams, and if you can continue to win games, which I think the Panthers can do. Now, I don't think the Panthers are going to finish undefeated just because, you know, you're going to get to a point where you're guaranteed to win your division, and they're pretty much there already. But there comes a point where you don't want to play your starters, and that might lead to a loss. Like in uh, 2009, Colts were 14-0. and They were playing the Jets. They were up at the half. Then they pull Peyton Manning, and they put in Curtis Painter, and then they end up losing the next two games, go 14-2. and two. It wasn't a big deal, really. I was upset. Well, I, I wasn't. wanted them to be 16 out. And they would have been, too, because, I mean, they had the Jets, and then the Bills the next game. That's true. <laughs> so the Panthers play at Tennessee, and then they come home to face Washington, and then they travel to Dallas on Thanksgiving. And all three of those are really winnable games. But they just got to take it one game at a time, like we've said. Why does Dallas always get Thanksgiving games? Because I, it's it, Dallas history. I, it, I you do. know, nobody wants to watch the. Well, maybe maybe Tony Romo will be back. Hopefully, but, you know they still stink. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you know I um I I hate it when you know these people are like oh you know Dallas Cowboys still have a chance you know when Tony Romo comes back. What, you expect him to win like eight games in a row and then get a wild card at the most? Like, are you kidding me? That makes absolutely no sense to me. The I think the Cowboys are done this Tony week. Romo, the pick machine? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, anyway, looking ahead yeah, to this <laughs> week, um, my game of the week would probably have to be... Um, Patriots Giants. Um, you know, they have a history there. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately for the Patriots. Eli Manning has Tom Brady's number in the <laughs> he, playoffs. Yeah, he really does. Um and uh yeah, you know, the Giants, you know, they're they're known for uh pulling that upset. So, you know, we'll we'll see what happens uh with the Patriots. But yeah, that'll be a really interesting game. Eli hasn't been terrible this year. Two thousand three hundred and thirty nine yards, nineteen touchdowns, six picks. Not not terrible numbers. Those so are great numbers. Exactly. He's he's yeah. playing some good football, but the Giants they just all I feel like it's always been that way for the Giants. Manning plays well, but nobody else does. Well, both years when they won when they won Super Bowl forty two and then Super Bowl forty seven, I think they were ten and six both years. Mm-hmm. And they would start out like five and four, then they would get hot, win some road games, then work magic in the playoffs, which is something that the Giants are always capable of. I mean, when you have Eli Manning, he's capable of great things, and he's capable of terrible things. You know, he's the baby brother of Peyton, so everybody <laughs> expects him to be great. And he's a better playoff quarterback than oh, his older ab- brother. Absolutely. He has but I think his brother's far. a better regular season quarterback. So it's kind of it's actually kind of interesting that they f- like they flip when it comes playoff time. But anyway, my game of the week, I'm going to go with the Sunday night game. Seahawks Cardinals. Cardinals 6 and 2, Seahawks 4 and 4. Only two games separate those teams. So if the Seattle Seahawks can pull this one out, they're a game closer to the Cardinals in the NFC West out there. That's just a huge matchup as far as winner of the NFC West goes cuz we I feel like the Seahawks always do this. They start mediocre and then they catch fire and then manage to get to the Super Bowl. You know, I don't think they're as good a team this year as they were last year. And um, so I think this is going to be a really pivotal game for them if they want to keep their playoff hopes alive and not dip below 500. You know, Seahawks fans are all happy and glad they're 4-4 four and four after starting 2-4. and four. Yep. But those wins came against the Chicago Bears, 
<laughs> Detroit Lions, San Francisco 49ers, and the Dallas Cowboys without oh Tony Romo. Legion's back, baby. Oh, oh yeah. Legion of Boom. All, all four of those are, re- are just bad wins, really. <laughs> Like, mm-hmm. none of those teams are any good, so I wouldn't be happy you're 4-4. Four and four. You know, it's really kind of almost almost surprising, but at the same time not, to see Carson Palmer putting up the numbers that he's putting up. Over 2,000 yards passing already, 20 touchdowns, and it the Cardinals somehow, they are always at best when they have a, an old quarterback with Kurt Warner. He took him to a Super Bowl and almost won them a Super Bowl. I still don't think that he Santonio Holmes got his feet in bounds, but whatever. <laughs> um, you know, they find a way to win with old quarterbacks, and the Cardinals' formula for success has been riding the old guys, Palmer, Johnson, and Fitzgerald. All of them are they're not they're not old by as far as human lifespan goes, but by the lifespan of a player in the NFL, they are old. But they found a way to win. And that's something I've enjoyed seeing this year is that the Cardinals have been able to ha- put together a good team centered around a, an aged and experienced group of, pe- of men. All right, we've got a few minutes here. The game that I'm looking forward to most is Vikings-Raiders. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the Vikings are really going to have to rely on their defense in this game because I don't think they have quite the passing game to keep to keep up with Derek Carr and the Raiders. I know Teddy Bridgewater is capable of making some great throws, but, you know, the formula for them has been defense and Adrian Peterson, who's leading the league in rushing. And so if the Vikings can stop the Raiders on defense, then they're going to win this game because, you know, Adrian Peterson, he's going to have, he's going to be steady all season. And so you just, that that one uh, variable that you don't know is how great is the passing game going to be for him. You know, you guys really took all of my key games this week. So I'm, I'm not even going to say a key game. <laughs> Although I do want to talk a couple minutes about college basketball. That starts Friday night, I believe. You got the big 24-hour tip-off marathon. That's quite possibly the greatest tip-off marathon in the sports world. So, Evan, I know you like IU. So what, what is something we can expect this season in college All right. basketball? All right, so Indiana, that's kind of really the only team that I know a whole lot about. They have maybe the best backcourt, top five backcourt in the NCAA. I mean, James Blackman Jr. and Yogi Ferrell, I mean, they can shoot the lights out, and they are lightning fast. They are great at facilitating an offense. And just the three-point shooting on Indiana, it's just through the roof. I mean, they they pretty much lived and died by the three last year. I mean, they were making like nine threes a game, which was just ridiculous. I mean, there was a game where they had like 16 three-pointers against Minnesota. I mean, it was it was crazy. But the one thing that held them back was their defense. I mean, especially, well, defense all around. Perimeter, they couldn't stop the three-pointer. And in the interior, because, I mean, the only one you had was Henry Mascara Perea. And, you know, he's off the team now. He was really their only big man. But, you know, this year it's going to be that interior play, and it's going to be, you know, when they're shooting their threes because they're going to take 20 threes a game. It's just are they making them or not that's going to make or break them. Right now they're right around, I don't know, 15th. I think that's where they're uh, ranked to start the season. And so it's going to be exciting because the Big Ten's going to be really good. I mean, you got Maryland, you got Indiana. Purdue's going to have a good season too. And so it's just going to be fun to watch. So what is your prediction for the national title? Uh, Who's going to be who? All right. I like Maryland over Duke. Ooh, I I like that. You know, I, I think Maryland, they have a good shot to go far this season. They've kind of quickly risen almost from being a team that wasn't really thought of to a team that's highly thought of this season. I think they're ranked fourth. In the preseason, uh, number, number number one, number, number one. two. I, UNC's number one. Okay, Maryland's number two. Okay, so, so they're up there. Yeah, yeah, they're they're a really really good team, and they're just gonna be fun to watch. They're gonna win the Big Ten this season. Um, I honestly, I think the Big Ten is gonna have an up year. There's gonna be a couple teams from the Big Ten that are gonna be contending. Um, I, I just, I'm ready for college basketball. It's just gonna be a fun season. College basketball is by far and wide my favorite sport to watch and look at so I'm, I'm just really excited that it's coming back so you're going with maryland over duke in the finals as well um i'm gonna go with maryland i i don't know over 
I'm going to go with the Cinderella team. So not Duke, not North Carolina, not a team that's highly ranked right now. I'm going to go with Maryland over a Cinderella. I don't know who, but somebody. You know, I pick Duke because no matter where they start the season, they always... It's you know, Coach always, K. Yeah, I mean, he just works his magic. And he they do awesome. Literally a legend. Unless they lose to, like, a 15 seed again. Not that I... bad. <laughs> So I know Nate doesn't watch college basketball enough, so I'm not sure if he wants to make a prediction here or if he'll just... I have a prediction. LSU basketball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kentucky will be good. As always. <laughs> no. That, that's a solid prediction right there. I don't care. Ohio State could go 1-30 in 30 if their one win is over Kentucky this season. That's all I care about. So for my prediction, this season I really like Wichita State. I mean, I know they play in a weak conference again. Again, again, again. again. Really, I honestly, I think they would be. I think they're going to be down this year. Fre- Fred Van Fleet and Ron Baker are their two returning. Seniors, That's true. Seniors are in charge of that backcourt. They should be really good this season. I, I think on my college basketball preview, I had them in the top five, maybe. You know, the great thing about college basketball, it's not like college football where if you're in a weaker division, you have no shot at the title. Yep. Because even if, you know, Wichita State has some unfortunate losses, they end up like a six seed, they can still go all the way. I mean, you never know who's going to win it. And so that's what that's what make it makes it so exciting. That's why I mean, football needs a 64-team playoff. Plus, <laughs> I mean, you have the FBS and you have all of these Fs, uh, mm. well, I guess, teams that are in the FBS in football, and then you throw in teams that are in the FCS in football too, like Creighton, who, who's who been good in recent years. I don't think they'll be good this year, but they were a team that people were watching. And you just get all of these teams like St. Louis, Detroit, that you know they, they, go, they get thrown into the mix, Florida Gulf Coast, that you've never heard of before, and they would surprise people. You so, know. That's what, because we don't, somebody's going to surprise us and we don't know who it is. The Big Dance is the best tournament in the entire sports world. Yep. 64 teams vying for one title. Actually, it's 68 because they got playing games. Yeah. Any one of those 68 teams could win. You know, we've never seen a 16 team upset a one seed. It's, I honestly, I think it's going to happen in our lifetime. I, I think it will. That's just the way college basketball is. And I just, I love college basketball. Yeah, it's great. You know, some people, they don't watch till March, but I'm one of those guys that, you know, follows Indiana yeah. all year, follows the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to keep track of <clears throat> who plays for who sometimes because you have all these freshmen coming in. But even still, it, it, it's just it's fun to watch. I love it. I love <laughs> college sports in general. So my prediction is North Carolina over Wichita State. Homer pick. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about there. <laughs> all right, Mr. All Over the Map. <laughs> that is the end of our show. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of the Rational Fans Podcast.